started using Python around version 1.4, 1.5. Uh, what brought me to Python is uh, 132com and uh, a application server. Back when there were application servers in the beginning of the 2000s, uh, called Zoe. And my the the most awesome experience I've ever had at a conference was the first Python conference I went to, and uh, that was the eighth international uh, Python conference, the IPCs, and. I think that uh, it was really interesting for me personally because a lot of the people who I met were doing very, very, very different things. I would say probably you know, 30% of the, the conference was people doing, 30% uh, were, were scientists and it was just really, really amazing to, to meet and talk to people about what they were doing with Python. And uh, what was really exciting actually was going up to this place, being snowed in for three days, which I'm from the south of, the United States where we don't get snow. Uh, so we have several hundred people becoming friends over beers and, and not being able to get out of the hotel. Was I actually met someone who was in Houston, Texas, uh, where I live, um, who actually was both a, a, a very well, uh, a, a Python expert and had similar interests. And then probably about a year and a half later, um, or actually, by that time, there was a, a Zoke channel. I don't remember what IRC uh, network it was on. But it was pretty interesting because the people who would hang out there were just me, uh, some Norwegian who would randomly float in and out, and a guy who was a uh, embedded engineer for Novellus uh, doing Zoke things. And the Norwegian uh, was, was really interested in, in sort of usability and accessibility and, and was trying to use these Zoke technologies, and he couldn't really get very far with them, uh, there wasn't very good documentation. And uh, he said, well, listen, how about, how about we take this, this, this Zoke thing that these guys have been making called the CMF, and maybe we can, we can make it look really, really nice, and, and then we can use that for consulting projects. And I'm like, hey, that's really great. If you're doing the HTML and all that stuff, then you know, that's, <laughs> let's do it. And as, long as, I, as long as I don't have to touch that, I will be happy. And uh, it was pretty interesting. Within about 48 hours of him, um, uh, of him, uh, of us having this conversation, a friend of his uh, did a design prototype of what this app would look like. And oh, there we go. All right. And uh, in about 48 hours, we had our first sort of Zoom product, and it looked kind of like clone. I see pictures of it. And um, we did actually some consulting contracts around that time together. And for about two years, we, we talked every other day. Um, and then at EuroPython, which was the first Python conference I went to in Europe, uh, we met for the first time and, and released the, the 1.0 version of this, or I think we did. And uh, it was really great because there were all these people you know, in Europe, uh, I had gone to the Python conferences, and you know, there was it was the exact same type of person. You know, everyone who was really interested in in uh, technology, very very friendly. Uh, people weren't um, uh, rude or or sort of uh, looking down on anyone. Or I mean, everyone was sort of peers, and and everyone was was doing this thing called Python, and and that was really great. Um, and by meeting a bunch of people in Europe, I, uh, I think what was really interesting is that the, the, the relationships we had, uh, these, these people that we met were the first people to sort of sponsor sprints and, and they you know, would, would sort of self-gather and the first one was in Bern, Switzerland and you know, fly me over or pay half my fare or whatever it was. And, and we'd hang out in, in Bern, Switzerland, and I'd sleep on someone's couch, and we'd just sort of hack, and, and uh, we had probably 30 people there, the first one. And, and they progressively got more and more sophisticated, which was really fun. I mean, uh, at the, 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 the snow sprints, which uh, I think the last one uh, there was, was on the top of a mountain in the Alps with a, a satellite uplink, where they had to sort of turn electricity off uh, between the hours of 1 a.m. and and 8 a.m. But 
it was really about the relationships that, that we made with the, the people in Europe. And then I started, you know, trying to come up with that. I had more people that were interested in, uh, in me doing work for them. And I somehow found some Brazilians who were really, really smart guys. Uh, and it was a company called X3 and G. And the two guys I got along with very well were uh, Sidney da Silva and, and Dornelis Kermer. And it was, really, it was really quite fun for me because, you know, I met these guys. All right, we have a project. Let's work together. And I'm like, hey, listen, you know, let's go over the requirements and how this thing's going to work. And let me, you know, what's your phone number? And they're like, no, 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 no. no we, don't speak, we don't speak English, but if you type it, we can read it. And, uh, and so we did work for a few years. I came to, uh, to Porto Alegre in 2007 or 2006. It seems like it was 2004. 2004? OK, wow. <laughs> and, uh, and it was just great. I mean, I, 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 I tell people about that experience um, every time. Every time someone asks me about, you know, about open source or, or, or what are the coolest things that have happened to you in, in, uh, in working in open source, I talk about that, uh, that event. Sort of like high profile government users and, and just sort of the government, the, the Brazilian government embrace of, of open source like this was just mind, mind blowing. And then probably not too terribly uh, long after that, uh, we started a nonprofit, which was seeded by uh, a large uh, company called Computer Associates, which was a pretty interesting process to go through. I would not recommend it unless you absolutely have to have a, a nonprofit. And um, if someone's going to do the legal paperwork for you, that's great, but you have to kind of maintain this thing. And so buddying up with something like the Python Software Foundation or any other sort of nonprofit is, is, a, is a good idea. And then other things happen. Uh, CIA's website, the FBI's website starts using it. Um, we have all these different kinds of content delivery strategies that people start working on. Uh, Pwn starts evolving into using uh, something called the component architecture. And Pwn starts actually adopting all these technologies very, very rapidly. Um, and unfortunately, at the same time, you know, as we're doing more sophisticated projects, we we realized, well, you know, we don't know how to do both these sophisticated projects where we're the developers and support all these use cases for the end users of the software who made the software very popular. So we start removing huge amounts of functionality uh, or, or not supporting it as a first class, and that sort of really rubs people the wrong way. And then at some point, uh, Things people just start complaining. All, you know, there's a huge amount of attrition inside the community. People are complaining all the time, and you know, the the, the Plum community sort of saying, you know, so a lot of people are saying, well, what's going on? I mean, I understand this. Why doesn't anyone else understand this technology? And uh, it, I think it became a reflection point for the Plum community. It's probably like 2009 or, or 2000, 2008 or 2009, where where. By the, at this point, we had consumed so much technology without any sort of documentation or sort of ex explaining why we're using this technology or what are the benefits of the technology. And, uh, and, and people, people just got quite upset about it. Um, the, the, the most frustrating thing, I think, from, uh, from someone who was involved in a phone community uh, who was not necessarily a, 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 a hardcore developer was you know they had a way to sort of work with the system and then we sort of just kind of cut them off, and it was sort of you know you do it our way or you know or the highway and a lot of people were saying well you know we don't understand your way and it's not documented so why um, and a lot of the decisions that we had in Plone uh, at this time were actually very very valid I and mean, they're, they're they're still quite valid uh, uh, they're all very valid decisions and 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 reason and rational ra rational. Uh, choices, but you know the documentation was poor. We actually took sort of a, a laid-back approach to complexity management with regards to sort of the decomposition of, of the framework and how the application worked. And it just and and, and we were sort of accumulating it sort of quite a bit of technical debt. And we didn't really want to tell people that there was an old way that we wanted to cut off because we didn't really have a good way of doing it in the new way. And, 
And really, when it came down to it, I, I think that you can say that we did not have a, a honest look at all the different technology and identify the users who were going to consume the technology uh, and sort of explain, you know, what are the different values of where are we trying to go and what are the values of the technology stack that we have today and how do we align with where our goals are. And that's a very, very hard thing to do for a community of people. I mean, everyone has different, uh, has different sort of uh, motivating factors to make their decisions. So a little bit about the Plum community. How does this actually come about? Uh, I would say that most of the Plum, most of the Plum community were, uh, they sort of fit into the sort of Zoop community. I mean, the Zoop, the Zoop community was kind of this really weird Petri, Petri dish where uh, there's a lot of sort of innovation that ha was happening. And, and if you sort of understand the, 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 it actually sounds really weird if you're outside of it looking in, but if you, sit down and kind of understand what these problems that were being solved, uh, what, what, they were, what, the, what, what the, 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 the reasons for solving these problems, uh, I think they're, they're still very valid today and very interesting. And you know, the, the sort of Zoop luminaries are, are, are sort of rather smart people. And, and most importantly, these are the, these, these, some of these people in the Zoop community actually are, the, uh, are people who have helped generate Python infrastructure. Uh, Philip E.D., uh, uh, some of the Zoop guys, uh, uh, Chris McDonough uh, creating Whiskey, uh, Tarek now doing uh, Distribute, LXML, uh, Martin Fessel. So there's like all these really, really, really intelligent people who, uh, who, were, who were doing this sort of technology, but, and, and not just those guys, but sort of the, the, the Plum guys, and we never really sort of framed exactly who, what, what problems are we solving, and really sort of documenting that in a way that the people who we're trying to satisfy could, could actually use, use the technology and could give us feedback about are we actually succeeding uh, solving these people's problems. And, and I think documentation, I, I heard, I, I had a, a chat today with someone who was sort of railing against uh, some technology and saying, oh, the documentation is just terrible, and, and everything is, you know, too complicated, and, and that's a completely valid criticism. I mean, you know, sophisticated, you know, doing complicated, complex things is, is well complicated and, and, and complex. And so, document, not having documentation does hurts it substantially. And I think that, you know, documentation kind of came very late into the culture of uh, open source software projects. And I think my my feeling is the the the, the project that that added that into cultures was Django. I think that, I mean, that is the best thing uh, that, that's come out in, in the, the last few years as far as a cultural phenomenon uh, for open source communities. And reading your documentation actually helps you sort of understand not just the audience, but also understand like whether your technology is insane. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're talking to someone who's trying to, to, to do a task and you're making them jump through a bunch of hoops, well, I mean, there's a, a big problem there. Uh, it's, it's very, very similar if you're if you're writing a, a paper, and uh, if you're writing sort of any sort of paper in college, what you end up doing is one of the, the, the best ways of, of getting feedback, at least where uh, the school I went to was the first thing you did is you sit down and you, and you had someone uh, who was editing it, you would read the paper to them, and sort of once you start reading the paper, you sort of hear what you're saying and sort of start taking your notes and you kind of edit it yourself. It's very it's it's, it's a very very easy. Uh, step to skip in software because documentation is really boring. And, you know, a lot of people think it's really boring. I don't think that's the case at all. I think really great documentation is just as uh, as much of a, a prized artifact as the software itself. Uh, but it's 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 absolutely critical for us to to uh, to identify that. Um, so one of the one of the questions I think that I have you know. I'm, I'm very interested in what people's opinions are, uh, are sort of, you know, what, was there anything unique about Zoop that affected, you know, that got people who were contributing these really interesting uh, technologies that pushed Python forward? Um, was that something to do with Zoop? Was that something to do with the community? You know, why, why, why was, why, why, why do these people uh, uh, find, the people who are actually interested in writing software that would sort of benefit the Python community, why would they be attracted to Zoop? 
And, um, and I think that there's some fairly unique technologies that maybe if these technologies didn't exist, those people would not have been interested in, in, in so. And, and I think that they're uh, very interesting technologies for everyone to sort of understand at least sort of the very basic concepts. You know, the, uh, the object, uh, object persistent system, uh, the concept of traversal versus uh, URL dispatch and web, and uh, uh, the component architecture and some of the security ideas behind it. And you know, from a from a from my point of view, I mean, I wasn't really terribly interested in writing software uh, in the first place. I was really interested in sort of meeting a bunch of people and and having great you know having great personal relationships and actually doing doing work and feeling like I'm I'm contributing to to the Python ecosystem. Um, but I think there is a, a really good question of sort of, you know, what makes people who want to contribute to the broader system or to the broader ecosystem, what makes them stick around and what attracts those kinds of people? So, you know, if we, if we don't do that, <laughs> if, we, if we have these, if we have people who come to projects and they do not actually sort of level up and, and actually feel like they're contributing, and they feel like they're not if they, if they feel like they are not contributing to the, the, the Python ecosystem, you know, it, we're gonna have a really big problem, right? I mean, over time, I mean, we have to have fresh blood in to the community. It's not like the stuff runs itself. I mean, there's a, uh, this is all free, free time and, and no one's getting paid to sort of help build these things in, in, inside of Python. And I really think that these, these the way that I look at it, I look at this is that, you know, Clone and, and Django and so and Pyramid are all sort of gateway drones. I mean, these are these are sort of the the, the, the thing that someone wants to use or, or or is using something to solve a very quick problem. And on a whole, I think that you know the the it, the reason why people really get hooked into these drones is not really because of the actual technology. I think. It, the, the actual implementation of, of, of the framework, I think it's actually Python, the language itself. And, and, and that is the, I mean, all the other technologies have huge shortcomings, but Python actually, with, with, even with its warts, it is, it's, it's a really fun and productive technology in a great community of people. And I think that that's something that we have to keep in mind and, 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 and sort of uh, always, always be mindful of that. The other problem, or another question that I would have is, what happens if the platform uh, as a service sort of takes off and you know, the gateway drugs are no longer Django or they're no longer Clone or so they're Google App Engine? And then you know, there is no sort of self, you know, there's no community building aspect around these kinds of uh, platforms. These platforms are, uh, they may be very productive, but I mean, we may not be able to actually get people, you know, from from that point, the social aspect, from actually using something like App Engine into the broader Python community. And I think that that's something that, uh, as a as the, the free software movement is 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 needs to sort of recognize, and, and I think Stoltman has has had thoughts about it. But um, I just don't see it possible to create a community around Google App Engine. I just, I, I'm I'm unsure that that will happen. So um, I think that if, if we look back on, on what, you know, over the last 12 years or 13 years, we can look at what the different sort of frameworks have brought to, brought, brought to the Python community and the broader open source uh, ecosystem. And I would say that Zoop uh, was, was quite the trailblazer with a lot of the concepts it had. Um, I had someone, you know, I mean, so, I mean, I, I, I don't think no SQL terminology or that, that label had existed in 1997. Um, but magically, sort of, we would have all been using it. Um, but the, the real interesting parts of Zoop are, are, are sort of this, the, 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 these three concepts, I think. Zoop.interface is really interesting. Uh, the, the, traversal, the concept of traversal is very, 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 very interesting. And Pyramid does a great job for people who don't, you know, who want, who, who just want to look at it at a, uh, to, to, to interact with it with very good documentation. I think that Pyramid is a great way of, of getting your, your toe wet for traversal. And Django for keeping it insanely simple and having fantastic documentation. And the plum culture, I think, was uh, very, 
uh, very productive in creating an application that is quite sophisticated, that solves a, a lot of real world problems that people install and use and, and uh, get, get a lot of business value from it. And the, the, the sort of, in a lot of the cultural aspects that I was talking about with Sprints and, and such. And, and, I, and, and of course I'm a little bit biased, but I, I believe that, that Pyramid is, is really doing it, doing it right from the beginning. Uh, great documentation and, and sort of being able to scale with someone starting with a one module, one Python module that works and, and being able to scale all the way up to something probably as complicated as Plum if, if, if someone desired to build that. And in the Python community we have some fairly substantial problems. Uh, uh, we have uh, our packaging systems. Uh, I hear people who are complaining about packaging. The, I think that there's a, a lack of understanding of what packaging may, may be and what the benefits are. Um, uh, packaging is a very sort of important aspect of, of sort of having a, a vital software ecosystem. Um, uh, PyPy.python.org has substantial problems with quality of service. Uh, we, you know, there, there, there are people, if, you, if you're interested in, in volunteering, it is, I'm sure that there, there are people that, that could use your time uh, in helping that. We don't, we don't really have a, a, a Python magazine in the United States anymore. That's always something that's quite easy to, to have locally. I'm not sure if you guys have a Python magazine. No. Um, pushing Python into, into sort of high schools and college. And the, there's there use Python in the high school context. Um, I think it's gotten mixed reviews. A lot of it is just you know training people and, and, and getting people out of the mode of thinking that well you know there's only two languages Java and .NET. And you know we have uh, meetups and sprints. I, I was quite shocked. Argentina, they, they didn't seem to, to, to do them very, uh, to do them quite a lot. And, and, and Houston, Houston is not a, a huge Python community. We're, we're a fairly large city, but I mean, at a Python meetup, we have 10 people, plus or minus 10 people each time, right? I mean, sometimes no one shows up. If I'm talking, no one shows up. I, I think this is true that he, he facilitated Python usage and, and evangelism of, of the language itself throughout uh, South America. He wasn't just sort of you know localized inside of Brazil. I think he actually really you know felt it like felt felt something he wanted to share with with people who uh, uh, he, he you know people in South America. Now I'm asking greatly. And so, do I know this was two dollars? So I'm here for at least until Sunday. Uh, I'll be floating around. Please just come up to me, talk to me if you have any questions. I, I have all sorts of opinions about everything, just like everyone else. Most of them are wrong. Uh, and that's it. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I think I, I, I may have two or three minutes. Uh, is that right? Where is it? Okay. I don't want to use the last one. Any questions? Hi, Alan. Thank you for your speech. I, I do not have a question. I have a comment. 
Uh, I'm not uh, sure if you're aware that in 2004, we were in the hallway, uh, Sydney, Donnellis, me, Hamad, and others, and uh, we were talking about the gathering of the Brazilian community. And uh, we were uh, wondering about the idea of making a conference. And you made the comment that uh, we should start small, that we were already big enough for a first conference. And, and uh, that comment was the turning point for the realization of the first uh, conference of Python in Brazil. So uh, I would like to thank you in the name of this community. Uh, if uh, our conferences are a tradition, uh, you have, uh, you're one of the guys to blame. Well, so thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. I don't remember it. <laughs> it could have been because of the Caprininas. Uh, but I, 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 I'll say that I had a, a, a identical, the same, the same thing that happened, the experience you had. Um, I, someone had, uh, I had the same experience with someone else. Um, it was when we released Plung One, uh, Paul Everett, who is at Zocorp, said, oh, you know, next thing you know, you'll have a Plung conference. And I was like, oh, no. We'll never have a fun conference. This is this isn't going to be you know, anything. And then probably within two years or something like that, we have our first fun conference. But I think it's great. I mean, I think you guys have a great showing, and this is a, this is a, a really really good community from, from everything I know. Is that it? Douglas. saber se você tem algum algum caso de uso do clone que você tenha ficado efetivamente feliz de ter feito o clone algum caso que te emocionou que te que você ficou feliz assim por fiz essa tecnologia uh, ok so The question was, well, the, yeah, the translation was, I've never, I've never done that before. That was pretty far out. Uh, so the question was, uh, I guess everyone can, can also confirm the translator. Uh, can I explain a usage of clone that was successful? Um, and I believe that the guy has had success with clone? Yes, okay. He did not have success with clone. Right, 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 right. Well, so personal uh, realization. Move you, move you personal ah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I, uh, yeah, I didn't get that. Okay. So, so um, I, the most impactful thing that I saw uh, with Plum was the maybe the second or third sprint, where um, well, we've been doing all this sort of accessibility work. Like, and I didn't really know why, I just sort of, like, I assume, I don't know anyone that's blind. <laughs> I just, we just do, do this stuff and, and, and everyone sort of cracks the whip around it being something that's important. And at the, at the sprint, we had uh, someone from the Austrian uh, uh, Blind Association of the Blind uh, show us how uh, someone with a visual impairment can, could interact with it because of the accessibility work we had done. And that was, That was pretty impressive. I mean, that was that was uh, something that really moved me and and and, and made me realize that, that this is a, a huge underserved audience. And, um, and I think that I think that Plum for quite some time was probably one of the only CMSs, you know, that was fairly easy to use, or, or you know, actually could you, you could you could even use it um, if you had uh, if you were blind. And so now this, we have a tradition, actually. At Penn State, uh, we have one of the plum symposiums, and we actually sort of see what the gap is now between uh, someone who cannot uh, not see and actually using the application and with, with a team of people to sort of yearly kind of get, get on the same page. And it's gotten quite, 
got pretty good with it. All right, well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Jackson? Do I still have time? E essa é a última pergunta. E sim, estou protegendo meus amigos. <risos> ele, ele, me, ele ameaça me bater e ele joga tudo. Queria aproveitar a oportunidade para ouvir a opinião de uma pessoa né, igual você, que tem experiência. para ouvir a, a sua opinião, né, com a experiência né, no clone. É, né, a gente tem passado aí algum, é, a comunidade de clone no Brasil, varia um pouco aí de empolgação, às vezes, é, quando né, tem, tem tempo que está muito evoluído, todo mundo acha legal, todo mundo, ah, depois é, varia um pouco, né, cai um pouco a empolgação, agora volta de novo com o clone 4. Como que está esse aspecto? de aceitação, de, empolga... né, de empolgação com o clone no restante do mundo aí, né, você tem mais experiência internacional aí, poderia falar alguma coisa sobre como que está o, o clone no restante do mundo para a gente? Ok, so the, the... <laughs> uh, so the question was, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a clone community of people using the software and um, And sort of there's sort of peaks and valleys where people get excited and they sort of get depressed and get excited and, and there's sort of this this sort of mood swings that happen. Well, I mean, so so I, I would say that there, that happens very often in in software, probably period. But I, I'll I'll tell you, I can give you something that kind of maybe helps illustrate the point. So um, we hired a guy who was um, a really, he's by a civil team, he's a really, really smart guy. And he's like, man, all, you know, I put it on the clone channel and everyone is just completely just tearing this technology up and they're just completely against it. And, you know, and it's like the clone, you know, it's the clone channel. It's like you go there and you ask for something and then people just complain about it. And, um, and I think that that's, that's, that's unfortunate, but that actually shows in a perverted way how much people care. I mean, people really care about having, um, uh, really care about the technology, and they, they, they want it to be better. And uh, we know sort of what we've done wrong, and, you know, and we try to correct it, and we're learning how to correct it, and what the weaknesses are, and just and fixing it. And it is kind of, it's pretty manic sometimes. I mean, people feel, uh, you know, uh, fairly high highs and, 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 and low lows. And I think that's just the side effect of the, the more that you're exposed to the technology, you kind of see, like, wow, you know, this is really, really interesting stuff and very, it, it, it's very sophisticated. You can do lots of things with it. But then there's, like, these limitations. And the limitations are either through design or through documentation or through experience. And, um, and I think that that's just sort of a, a, a problem with, you know, um, a, a technology that a lot, it means a lot of different things to different people. And uh, there's a lot of different people that are being satisfied with uh, or being serviced with clone, satisfied or service. Um, and most of the people who are sort of, you know, I mean, you, you, my, my feeling is, I mean, the Europeans and, and people in America, I mean, most people are, are pretty frustrated by some things and know that it would be better if we did this or if we had done that. But at the same time, these people, you know, hindsight, I'm saying hindsight is, you know, perfect vision. Um, when you're looking in the, in the rear, you know, and backwards, you always have perfect vision. And, you know, that's kind of, kind of where, um, where I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the plum and, and, and zip communities are, where there's a whole lot to look back on and a whole lot of really good and, and, and bad decisions. Um, and so that's kind of gives people uh, a, a weird sort of emotional effect. And 
and, and the technology is not like it's insanely malleable, right? I mean, it's an application. I'm not sure that answered the question. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Por favor, más adelante.